Good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome once again uh, to the next uh, IC. So, can I have this slide, please? Yeah. So, instruction course number 117 uh, we are doing now, and this is uh, basically all about how we uh, resurrect our trabeculectomies. Uh, uh, trabeculectomy still remains the most commonly performed procedure for glaucoma. And uh, we all know uh, and we all face failures. Uh, even, even though the procedure is good, but still, in fact, all glaucoma procedures, they have a uh, high rate of failure. So we don't have a perfect procedure yet. Uh, so, in this AC, uh, uh, in IC, we will talk about what we can do once the surgery has failed. Uh, there are different options available, but uh, I think if you can uh, revive your surgeries, that would be the uh, perfect uh, solution for us. So, so in this, uh, what we will be talking about is a little bit the pathophysiology of trabeculectomy failure, uh, how, why, how and why it fails. Uh, then there are different ways of what we can, uh, you know, restart functioning. Uh, we could do a uh, blood needling. We could do, you know, have internal uh, revision. Uh, we, I will also be introducing to a limited posterior blood revision to restore trabeculectomy function. And uh, then we have a fresh trabeculectomy or you can do the, you know, trabeculectomy the same side, the revision trabeculectomy. And then also something about how do we handle uh, post-procedure, uh, uh, how do we handle these cases. Uh, I'll take you the first talk, uh, that's by Dr. Natasha Gautam. She's not here, she actually recently moved to US, uh, but she has sent a presentation, uh, recorded presentation, so I'll play that on her behalf. Uh, you will have to open from there, please. Yeah. Second one, number two. Yeah. Maybe we have some. We go to the next slide. Yeah, video, sir. Mm -hmm. Here, here, run this video. Yeah. Okay. Sounding. Are, Huh? Yeah, yeah. Sound. Mm -hmm. We do Alexa for our Alexa. Alexa, Alexa, we have guys. Message is not included. Included, we have. This one. Yeah. Okay. My name is Natasha Gautam and I am going to discuss the pathophysiology of trabeculectomy blep failure. What is the ideal outcome of a glaucoma filtration surgery? To have a diffuse filtration blep. But what is the real scenario? There is a 10 to 60% chances of trabeculectomy failure and it depends on the case selection. And what are the reasons for failure? The most common reasons are the subconjunctival fibrosis which lead to scarred, insisted or flat bleb. There could be a blocked fistula due to iris, blood clot or vitreous. And there could be bleb leak or excessive filtration which again leads to the bleb failure. Coming on to the most common cause, the subconjunctival fibrosis which is the most common cause of failure and it happens due to fibroblast proliferation and scar tissue formation and episcleral tenon interface. The long term success of trabeculectomy bleb depends on the individual wound healing response. Regarding the phases of wound healing, it passes through the cascade of coagulative phase, then comes the inflammatory phase, proliferative phase, scar formation and wound modulation. In the coagulative phase, the activated platelets from the bleeding vessels release the growth factors like the platelet activating factor, serotonin, platelet 
derived growth factors, VEGF and various cytokines like interleukins and TGF-beta which act as chemoattractants. Then comes the inflammatory phase which causes the influx of neutrophils as early as 24 hours. There occurs differentiation of monocytes to tissue macrophages which happen around day 3 which release TGF-beta, PDGF, FGF, the epidermal growth factor and simultaneously there is activation of T lymphocytes which release interleukins, PDGF and other cytokines leading to continuous inflammatory phase. Then comes the proliferative phase which happens around one week in which there is generation of new tissue matrix through angiogenesis and fibroplasia. The platelet derived growth factor and the TGF beta are the main pro fibrogenic cytokines while the fibroblastic growth factor and the vascular endothelial growth factor are the main pro angiogenic factors. Scar formation occurs around 2 weeks that is around day 14 the fibrovascular granulation tissue starts leading to development of pro collagen, tropo collagen ultimately collagen formation occurs. Simultaneously there is wound modulation the remodeling phase which begins around 3rd to 4th week in which fibroblast cell death occur by apoptosis and remodeling of the primitive fibrovascular tissue occurs into a mature scar. This phase is primarily mediated by the matrix metalloproteinases and plasminogen activators. Let's see how is the wound healing after glaucoma surgery. It is much longer and leads to much more scarring than normal conjunctival wound healing. The proliferative phase of wound healing lasts much longer after GFS and it happens because of excessive proliferation of tenon and conjunctival fibroblast. They are differentiation of the fibroblast into the myofibroblast and the uncontrolled production of the extracellular matrix. This is a nice study to show the role of connective tissue growth factor as a regulator of scarring. In this, the authors observed that there was significant upregulation of CTGF in the human scarring tenon capsules when compared with the non-scarring tenon tissue by real-time RT-PCR. The CTGF primarily mediates and increases the signaling in the human tenon capsule fibroblast, which is evident because the number of viable tenon capsule fibroblast were reduced upon the CTGF knockdown and the knockdown of CTGF basically induces the G0 G1 phase cell cycle arrest. It does not significantly alter the apoptosis. Coming on to role of aqueous. This work was primarily conducted at PGIMER. It is under the process of publication. It was a prospective non-randomized experimental interventional study which was conducted on 92 rats. They were divided into three groups. The group A was the baseline which just got the conjunctival incision followed by a closure with a single tendon nylon suture and formed the baseline group. The group B had a silicon tube which was implanted in the subconjunctival space but it was not connected to the anterior chamber. So basically the group B had surgical trauma with the presence of foreign body. And in group C as we can see, the tube was connected into the anterior chamber. So there was surgical trauma, foreign body along with the aqueous flow. And that it was seen that the aqueous flow in the tissue acts as a strong driver of TGF beta expression more than the surgical trauma and the foreign body put together, leading to more inflammation, more vascularization and more scarring at the surgical site. Similarly, the presence of aqueous in the tissue appears to shift the timeline to right by 1 to 2 days, prolonging the duration of proliferation and delaying the remodeling. Coming on to the anti-inflammatory markers, the flow of aqueous led to suppression and delay in the expression of the interferon gamma as well as downgraded the expression of interleukin 10 which are the anti-inflammatory markers thereby prolonging the proliferative phase of wound healing and delaying the remodeling phase. So we all know that aqueous has something to do and changes the chemical milieu. But we try to look at the role of fluid 
which is name of aqueous and does not contain any mediators this was an interesting study which was again conducted at the same center along with another center in australia employing 17 new zealand rabbits and in this study an experimental gdd was implanted in the subconjunctival space without the connection to anterior chamber and after 28 days the balanced salt solution was passed through the implant for 30 to 40 minutes at 12 mm mercury that is the physiological pressure and we tried to look at the impact of the fluid which is name of aqueous on the capsular porosity which was retested at third and the sixth day and interestingly the capsular porosity fell by approximately 80% in both the groups from the baseline even after a single bss challenge there was no significant difference in the capsular thickness but there was significant decline in the capsular porosity compared to the baseline now coming on to some clinical high risk scenarios which predispose the patients to blep failure these are aphakia pseudophakia young age males black race neovascular glaucoma trauma uveitis failed trabeculectomy congenital and juvenile glaucoma which all predispose to the blep failure This was an interesting article discussing the role of echoemulsification and studying the cross-sectional morphological changes in the successful filtering blep after phaco using swept source 3D ASOCT. And they found that in the control group there was no significant difference either in IOP or ASOCT characteristics. But in the phaco group there was significant increase in the mean IOP and significant decrease in the blep height. maximum blep wall thickness and ratio of hyporeflective space of blep wall between pre phaco emulsification and one year post phaco emulsification and this was another interesting article which found that the latent infections caused by chlamydia trachomatis and bacterioid fragilis were significantly high in the patients who developed blep failure compared to the other patients who did not had blep failure so these low grade inf- infections in the poeg patients may present as a risk factor for post trabeculectomy blep failure and looking at the other end of the spectrum the thin cystic blebs the application of antimitotics at the time of surgery which we usually do to reduce the scar formation leads to early inhibition of healing thereby predisposing the eyes to wound leak hypotony and related complications ultimately causing the blep failure So to conclude the etiology of blep failure is double edged sword it is associated also with excess scarring due to complex wound healing after glaucoma surgery but is also seen due to excessive use of antimitotic agents predisposing to thin cystic leaky blebs so a better understanding of this process can help in development of targeted molecules and appropriately time the application of antimetabolites prolonging the bleb survival and improving the success rate of gfs thank you and have a good day so thank you uh, i think uh, in this uh, talk you have we have basically given you the you know the summary of what goes on in the in the trabeculectomy blab and why they fail it's very imp- important to understand the underlying mechanisms because when you are taking measure to prevent blab failure or subsequently if you want to uh, revive those blabs those timelines are very important because your intervention has to match uh, with what is you know going inside the blab or in the in the wound healing area and if that matches uh, you know correctly then you'll get better results uh the idea therefore is very important to understand the entire process uh, of uh, you know wound healing and uh, you know excessive scarring so as was mentioned in the lecture if you have a normal if you have a conjunctival injury or a conjunctival incision and uh, you know that heals within 7 days after 7 10 days you don't even know where the injury was it healed so well but trabeculectomy blebs they do not heal it takes almost you know up to 3 to 6 months actually and they actually never heal even after that they keep on evolving so that the tissue never come back to normal so the reason is that the underlying mechanisms they remain active uh, in these blebs and that is the reason that we have emphasized uh, so much on this so the the next uh, we'll go to you know can you close that all right
Okay, so the, the next uh, talk 